what I want to do is I really want to open up in prayer. And, you know, we were reading, Paula and I were reading some stuff uh, this week that talked about uh, 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 CBN, which is a Christian broadcast network, put out a, an article. Uh, and it really touched our hearts. And it's uh, about Ukraine and the Ukrainians and what they're praying as they're being attacked, uh, you know, by Russia. We all know what's going on over there right now. But, the, you know, the children, the, the church, and, and just people in general are, you know, opening up uh, God's Word and are praying Psalm 31. And what I'd like to do today is open up in our prayer with uh, Psalm 31. So, you know, if you would, open up your Bibles and let's just, uh, let's just jump into uh, our prayer because I want to read the whole psalm. But as we're reading, I'd like you to, you know, just lift up the Ukrainian people. I mean, they are under attack physically, spiritually, emotionally. And, you know, this is a battle that we are all called to support, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're here to encourage. We're here to support. We're here to pray. So why don't we open up our Bibles to Psalm 31? I'm going to read it. And we'll go through, and uh, you know, as I as I mentioned, just you know, lift up the Ukrainian people. You know, let's he have God hear our prayers, and let's have God answer our prayers in faith. We know that as we pray, as we hear from the Lord, we can you know put on our petitions these prayers. So. Let's meditate on, on God. Let's meditate on his word. And let's just open up in prayer. So Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord of God, truth. O Lord God of truth. I have hated those who regard useless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy for you have considered my trouble. You have known my soul in adversities and have not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a wide place. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes, my eye wastes away with grief. Yes, my soul and my body, for my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. I am a reproach among all my enemies, and am repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mine. I am like a broken vessel, for I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side." While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up, up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you. In the presence of the sons of men, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. From the plots of man, you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, 
for he who has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from you before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you, O oh, love the Lord, all you his saints. For the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, and you who hope in the Lord. Amen. I just wanted to, the Lord really put that on my heart this morning, and I really did want to bring this to all of our attention as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are not only in a physical war, you know, with, you know, the world, we're in a spiritual war with the world. And what I mean about the physical war, you know, we see these things happening. You know, bad things are happening in Ukraine right now. People are dying on both sides. Innocent people. Matter of fact, we've read many, many stories where some of the Russian army don't understand why they are invading Ukraine. But we know this where the physical crosses into the spiritual. We know what's going on. We know that Satan is driving this whole thing. We are starting to see evolve the ten nations. We are starting to see evolve Ezekiel 38 and 39. We can see the formation of these things happening now. So my recommendation is for those of you who don't really know Christ, for those of you who know Christ but don't want to give your life to Christ, today is the day, now is the time that we need to take life serious, take Christ seriously, and shed ourselves from the world. And through God's Word, seek salvation. Through His act of kindness, His love, through the crucifixion, through Christ's death, become a servant of God, a servant of Jesus Christ. So you may live for eternity. In this world, we all know that there is a temporary body that we live in. But for eternity, you are either going to live in heaven or you are going to live in hell. You have no other choice. So choose today to live in heaven. Choose today because time is short. Time is critical. And your choice is going to determine where you will rest for eternity. Don't kid yourself. Heaven is for eternity. We know this. But guess what? So is hell. If you choose hell, you will live there for eternity. Forever being tormented and dead. But in heaven, you find life and you find peace in you. We are face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. So our prayer for the Ukrainian people is Psalm 31 to protect them, to provide for them. Your Holy Spirit, your army of angels, Father, surround the towns in Ukraine, Lord God in heaven, and protect the people, protect your heirs. And Father, smite down the enemy. That's what we pray for. And you don't have to be in Ukraine to pray this prayer and to read this psalm because we get spiritually attacked all the time. We are attacked in this country. We are attacked in other parts of the world. As the body of Christ, we are attacked. So this is a great reminder through God's Word, even all the way back to the Old Testament, where some believe it is not relevant to us anymore, these prayers come. These words that are written and given to us in the Holy Bible have meaning today in our lives, in each and every one of our lives. So, in Jesus' name, we pray Psalm 31 over the nations of the world. And we pray for the Ukrainian people, Father. We even pray for the Russian people and the Russian government and the leaders in Russia because God does not want any soul to perish. And as sons and daughters of God, we should want the same thing, that no soul shall perish. So we need to pray for the leaders. We need to pray for the leaders of this country 
to intervene to provide for the people of Ukraine. Because when you strip everything back, all that matters is our salvation. Money doesn't matter. Power doesn't matter. And you know what? If you're chasing money and you're chasing power, you're still in the world. But if those things diminish in your life, the power, the money, and you're growing in Christ, then you are on the right path to finding our resting place in the kingdom of heaven and salvation forever. So today's message is encouraged to stay strong in your faith in Christ. And it is a very opportune time to see Paul encouraging the Colossian church as he encourages all the churches that he was ministering to in his letters. This is not the only time he sends a letter and writes encouraging words. Just about every letter we can read from Paul has words of encouragement and praying and yearning to see them. And at times, Satan has hindered him, as it tells us in uh, 1 Thessalonians, as Satan hinders Paul from going to these places, as Satan will hinder us from doing that too. And it looks, the hindering looks very, very different in many, many people's lives. You know, Paul was not allowed to go to Asia. Paul was not allowed to go to some of the churches. How was he hindered? He was imprisoned. How was he hindered? He had ailments in his body. Remember, the Bible teaches us, and Paul says this, that, you know, it was through God's grace that he was being held down by Satan because that kept his pride in check. When he cried out to God and he asked God to release him from the torment, from the persecution of Satan, God said, no. Because God knows that when we have pride, when we have things going on in our lives, when we think we are something in the eyes of God, he will tear that pride down. And this is why Paul became so effective in ministering to the churches, the churches he planted and the churches that he supported. Because remember, in Colossae, he did not plant this church. Epaphras planted the church, but he was there. He went full force into the church, writing a letter, starting out in the opening of the letter in encouragement. But the body has some exhortation to it and some admonishing. And then he closes with love and peace and grace and God's mercy falling upon the church. And for us today, we can take these words, we can take these examples, and we can pray for the people, not only in our nation, not only in our towns, but throughout the world. Because right now, as I mentioned, Satan's time is short. He knows it. And we are on the cusp of Ezekiel 38, 39, if we are not already in it. And God's judgment will fall upon this world. And we need to be prepared. Our saving grace is through the word of God. We will not be here. We will be taken. Jesus will come and take his church, his bride, home. We will not see God's judgment in any of the things that are about to take place in the tribulation. So we praise God for that. And we need to encourage others to stay strong in the faith in Christ. And that's the title of the message, Encourage to Stay Strong in Your Faith in Christ. So the introduction, let's, go, let's just jump into Scripture now. What does it mean to be in Christ? And who are you when you trust in Christ? Let's look, open up our Bibles to 1 Peter 5.9, and let's take a look at what Peter says, who we are. And this is just awesome scripture as it all is. It says in verse 9, 
So I'm going to read verse 8, and then we'll jump into verse 9, because I want to give you a little bit of context. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seek, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And more, and let me read 10. I, I just want to finish this up. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What more appropriate timing than this? that God have grace on us, that the sufferings that we're seeing our brothers and sisters um, being exposed to, that we have those same sufferings, maybe not in the same way, maybe not in the same fashion, but we all suffer. Satan wants to destroy us all. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to save us all. God the Father wants us all to live in eternity. And the thing that we need to focus on more is our salvation, is where is our final resting place. I know God is calling you. God is speaking to you. God is telling you it is time now. It is your time. And he wants you to decide. And he wants you to decide today that you will live your life for Christ. These things in the world will not matter once you give your life to Christ because your focus changes, your drive changes. Everything changes, but God will bless you. That doesn't mean he's going to put you in the corner. He's going to put you on the curb. He's going to bless you abundantly with the riches in the kingdom of heaven. There's no richer God in this world, in this universe than our Father, the Creator of all heavens and earth. So we're at a time, and the time is now to decide. So last week we seen through the ministry of Paul how God used Paul to evangelize the church and also make disciples of many just through his attack. Remember, we started, Paul started showing the Colossians, the Colossians, his ministry in verse chapter 1, verse uh, 24, and now we're in chapter 2, verse 5, where he's finishing up. He's established himself. He's established his ministry in the importance of it, and today we're going to finish up that message. So he concludes the service with strong words of encouragement, he concludes the gains that we will find, the riches we will have, and the full assurance that Christ is our Lord. That through Christ we will find salvation. We know the knowledge and the mysteries of God and His Son. As we read our word, those mysteries become more prevalent to us. We become more aware of who Jesus is. We become more aware of how Jesus works in our lives. We can see death and destruction all around us. Just turn on any news program and you will see it. But we are encouraged to stay strong in our faith because when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not die a spiritual death. We will die a physical death. We all die physical deaths. But our spirit will live for eternity in the kingdom of heaven. We will live for eternity in the kingdom of heaven. And that is the good news. And this is the news that Paul has to remind the church of. Because there's false teachings. There's false doctrine. There's Gnostic teachings going around in, throughout the first, second, third, up until the 10th century, even today. There's false teachings in the church. And Paul is reminding us not to be swayed by persuasive words, not to be fooled. If you believe this, 
then you are on your way to living a godly life. That if we are filled with the same spirit that God rose his son from the dead with, then the enemy, Satan, cannot come against us. Will he try and try and try? Will he try to destroy us? Absolutely. But if we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing that his act of death and resurrection brought us salvation, if we believe that with all our hearts, then we will end up in the kingdom of heaven when God is finally calling us home. And this is what Paul is trying to reassure the Colossian church with. So let's talk about a couple of things. How do you stay strong in your faith? What does staying strong in your faith look like? Before we get there, let's open up and let's read our scripture that we're going to study today. Colossians 2, 1, five, uh, 2, 1 through 5. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest any you Anyone should deceive you with pervasive, persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And we're just going to break those down in a couple minutes, but let me get back to the question I had. What does staying in faith look like? You know, for us, what does staying in faith look like? You have, I'm sure we all have some ideas on what that is. But let me give you some examples as the Lord was speaking into me about what it looks like to me. And maybe some of these things look the same to you. So the first one, staying centered in Christ. It says on Christ, it should be in Christ. What he has done for you, the work of the cross, what that means for us. If we stay centered in Christ and our focus is only on Christ, and that is very, very hard to do, don't get me wrong, but if we stay focused in Christ, then when we go through trials, when we go through tribulations, when we have joy, all of the above things that occur in our lives, if we are Christ-centered in our jobs, if we are Christ-centered, in the grocery store, if we are Christ-centered, life seems to be able to be manageable and bearable. And matter of fact, in most cases, enjoyable because our joy is not in the world. Our joy is in Christ, in Christ alone. This is where we find our joy in our happiness, in our peace, in our strength. It is in Christ. So staying centered on Christ and focusing on what he has done for us and what that means is critical. The next one, exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit. Now, these are not all the fruits of the Spirit. These are just some that come to mind for me. Righteousness, truth, love, joy, peace, goodness, long-suffering, humbleness, kindness. These things, these are the fruits of the Spirit as we are walking in the Spirit, as we are hearing the Lord speaking to us. And when we exhibit these attributes of the Spirit, the fruits, as the Bible calls them, as Paul tells us what they are, then we will lead a much more peaceful life. We will lead a much more uh, fruitful, beneficial life. But more importantly, when we exude these things from our body, the long-suffering, the righteousness, the kindness, the love that God pours into us, we pour that out to others. Then we start to see an encouragement from biblical principles, from the Lord Jesus Christ, as these fruits pour into us and they pour out of us to others. 
And sometimes it's all it's hard. Sometimes it's difficult to experience the fruits of the Spirit and to show them and to live them. But you know what? Through the strength of Christ, as we ask the Lord more and more and more and more, as we're in our word, then these fruits will become natural to us. And the Lord will transform us and sanctify us until he brings us to our glory state. And then we are in heaven together with the Lord Jesus Christ. The next one, staying in your word. It is so important. And these are and not in any order. These I just wrote down. But you can order them if you'd like. Staying in your word produces fruits, by the way. It also produces more faith. It also reassures us when we're going through trials because God's word is inerrant. God's word is our instruction booklet. When we go through hard times, when we go through good times, when we're trying to go through life in general, his word, staying in his word, staying so closely coupled to the Holy Spirit in his word is important because we as human beings, like to follow strange silver balls. And what I mean by that is we get distracted very easily. And when we're distracted, we're out of his word. We are distracted into the world. So staying in your word is important. The next one, knowing that Christ will meet you exactly where you are at in your life. This is so important. So many people think that they cannot receive Christ because they're not ready to receive Christ. They're not good enough to receive Christ. They're not worthy enough. But they don't understand who Christ is. Christ will come to us where we are at in our lives. It doesn't matter the sin that you've committed. If you ask and seek forgiveness, from the Lord Jesus Christ, and you repent your sins, he will meet you right at that place. The moment you do that, Christ is going to come, and he will speak to your heart, and he will speak to you, and he will show you his love. And you can start living the life of Christ that he has. Resisting temptation. And this is a really hard one because we are all tempted. I just said this a few minutes ago. The closer relationship you develop with Christ, the more Satan is going to attack you. The more Satan is going to come against you. Because why? Because Satan is a destroyer. He's a deceiver. Christ is a giver of life. So have the courage to say no. But you're, the courage, what I mean by that is you want, you have to want you need the desire to say no. You can't always fall back on the excuse, well, you know, I don't have the strength to do it. The question is, have you asked the Lord to strengthen you to say no? If you have not asked, then you are not being honest with yourself. You're not being truthful in the fact that you have not asked to strengthen, to have the Lord Jesus Christ or into you the strength to say no. So having the courage to say no includes asking the Lord to help you. Don't just think, well, God knows who I am. Therefore, if he knows who I am, he knows my sins, he can remove them. No, this is where free will comes in. God will allow you to swim in your sin until you are ready to ask him. For his help. That's an important one. Resisting temptation. The next one, fellowshipping, seeking godly counsel, talking with others about your circumstances. You know, being able to seek godly advice and make sure when you're seeking this advice, it's from godly people. You know, sure, you know, in the world, there are smart people and they have worldly advice. But I guarantee you, there is no better advice that you're going to get from the world than you would get from reading God's Word, meditating on His Word, seeking Him, praying for Him, and I'm waiting. My biggest problem these days are I'm impatient. I seek God, but I don't give God enough time, in, in some cases, to answer. 
and to prepare. And what is he preparing? He's preparing me. And I think we all suffer from that. There are times where God just wants us to sit still and know that he is God and be calm and not to worry because he has everything in control. So fellowshipping helps, you know, talking it out with others, seeking godly counsel, exposing your circumstances is a good thing. Praying for others and for yourself. Praying is outside of the crucifixion that Jesus went through, the resurrection. Praying is a, the greatest gift that God gives us. I've said this before. I'll continue to say it. It is our way to talk to our King, to talk to our Lord and Savior. God gave us the ability to pray. Everybody can pray. Everybody has the gift of prayer. The gift looks a little differently in other people's lives, but I believe this with all my heart. Everybody has the gift to pray. Now, you may not want to pray openly. You may be embarrassed, but again, let's pull back and ask God to give you strength to pray, to pray openly, communally communally pray, you know, so make sure you understand what I'm saying. Everybody has the gift to pray and to seek God. Now, if you're in an open environment and if you're in front of a hundred people, are you embarrassed? Are you shy to pray? Absolutely. But God will strengthen you. He will give you the words if you ask him. If we let go and let God work, so praying is very, very important in our walk in the Christian life. It is critical. Do not be deceived by persuasive language. Don't let others come up to you and try to convince you that you're on the wrong path. If you are paying attention to God's Word, if you are in God's Word and you are understanding God's Word and you are reading God's Word and the Holy Spirit is working on you and He's interpreting God's Word for you and He's pouring God's love and God's message into you. And your thoughts and your conversations are centered around God. And someone comes up to you and tells you that Jesus is wasn't a deity. Jesus isn't the Son of God. Jesus was just a man. You fill in the blank there, whatever people are trying to teach you, that the Old Testament has no relevance in your life today. You know, that is persuasive language, but it's false. Why would God give us from Genesis to Revelation in the Holy Scriptures if half of it was not relevant. You have to ask yourself these logical questions when you're hearing these things from people. Not just pastors are espousing this. People will learn this. People will try to interpret these things. And they are just wrong. And God gives us the Holy Spirit, a discerning spirit, so we may filter what we think is truth versus what we think is half truth. And if it's a half truth, it, there's a half of a lie there. Again, it goes back to prayer. It goes back to asking the Lord to strengthen you. So these are the things. This is what it looks like to stay in faith. If you are doing these things, any of these things, that's a good start. If you're doing all of these things, then you have a high probability to stay strong in Christ and walk with him, even when Satan comes and tries to knock you down. Christ is right there waiting for you to ask him to pick you up, to ask him to strengthen you, to ask him to move within you and to provide that path of righteousness and keep Satan off of that path. For you. He will do that. We are seeing the greatest example of faith right now in Ukraine. Again, that article by CBN, it's just heart-wrenching because you have children, you have adults, you have people 
who find hope in a hopeless environment through Christ, through Scripture. What greater, greater example do we have of encouragement, watching and reading and listening to these people open up God's Word and praying? It is a great and example of encouragement, and they are staying strong in their faith because they are face to face with adversity. I mean, literally. And we can see through their example that are they are staying strong. They are in the Word. And if we walk away today with that same faith, that we can stay strong and we can be encouraged through the Word of God, then we are on the right road. So let's get into our scripture, Colossians 2 1. For what? Uh, for I want you to know what a great conflict I have. For you and those in Laodicea, as for many has have not seen my face in the flesh. So the great conflict that Paul is talking about, the Greek for conflict is agon, agon, to engage in intense struggle involving physical or non-physical force against strong opposition to struggle to fight. So he struggles, he had great struggles to come for the church in Colossae to pray for them because he knows that they're starting to go down the wrong path, that the false teaching is coming in. And he has that same for us. And we should have that same conflict for others that we pray for. Now we know, as we learn, that Paul never visited the Colossian church. Paul never visited the church in Laodicea nor did he visit the church in Heropolis. So he was not in the Lycum uh, Canyon at all. So, but he was bold enough to know that the church is important. It was his ministry to encourage and to build churches. God commissioned him, and he took the time to write the letters to encourage and he continues on to share his ministry, the one that God gave him. God gave him the ministry. And we know that Paul became very humble. But we also know as Saul, he was very prideful. I mean, how could you not be? He was a Pharisee. He was the upper echelon of the Pharisees, by the way. And God took him from up here all the way down, if you recall in Scripture that he became the lowest of the apostles for the sins that he committed. Those are his words. God doesn't view him like that. God viewed him as a, an effective ambassador for Christ. How do we know he was effective? We're reading his scriptures every day. His letters in the New Testament are a testimony to God is not wrong. He chose Paul because Paul had a boldness. He had to shave a lot of the rough edges off of Paul and re get, rethink him. And Paul allowed that to happen. If we allow that to happen in our lives, the same can occur. Will we all become Pauls? No. There's only one Paul. But God has a life for you and I. And if we stay strong in our faith in Christ, we will realize that life that we have. God will give us that life. If we are in his will, if we are strong in faith, God gives us that. There's, there's no other place to be than in the presence of the Lord. No other place. Let's look at a supporting verse, 1 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Now, what's Paul saying there? Yes, he was mistreated. He stayed in Thessalonica for three weeks, and then he got whipped. He got run out of town. He got beat up in Philippi. 
but he still understood his mission. His mission was to get Jesus known throughout the region, and he did it willfully. Was there pain involved? Yes. He tells us all the time. He reminds us all the time that he was beaten. He was scourged. He was spat on. He was yelled at. Anything you can imagine. The persecutions that we go through today, I suspect Paul has a story for every one of them that we have. Paul went through them. So if he could do it and God gave him the strength to do it, we can do it. We can live through it. What Paul had was a strong faith in Christ, knowing exactly what his role was in the kingdom of heaven, what his mission was. We need to understand what our mission is, and we need to go full force into it with strong faith in Christ. And Christ will provide, and he will make the way. We believe that with all our hearts. It is true. Verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Their hearts may be encouraged. This is what he's doing. Why is he coming? Why was he suffering to come? So they could be encouraged. If we suffer anything, we should suffer for the betterment of someone else, to encourage them to move on, to encourage them to build the life that Christ has for them. But I'll tell you, in our lives, in our minds, we create circumstances and we create sufferings sometimes that are outside the will of God. Because we're not listening to God. We're not listening to him. Paul listened. He encouraged them. And he was saying, I want you to come together in love. Attain to all the riches, the full assurance. Now, what is full assurance here? Pleroforia. Pleroforia is the Greek, right? To be completely certain of the truth of something, to be absolutely sure, to be certain, completely certain, full of certain, the complete certainty of understanding of the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. So Paul is inclusive here. He's not just pinpointing God. He's saying God and his son Christ. To know the full mysteries, Paul is absolutely telling us God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the triune God, one in the same. And it's just important that we know this. Let's look at a supporting verse here. Ephesians 6.22, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose. He's really talking about uh, Tychicus now. Oops, I don't have a blank here. So he's talking about Tychicus, you know, that he's sending to go forward before Paul uh, to have him understand in Ephesians, the church, the purpose of why Paul is coming, the purpose why they are there, the purpose why they're serving God. So let's look at uh, verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So this is a continuation of verse 2. And their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. And knowledge. You know, there is nothing better than discovery. You know, I come from a technical background. I love learning. I love learning about anything. You know, certain things that, you know, I won't learn about, 
But, you know, learning about God, who God is, who Christ is, learning about the times in the first uh, century. I'm very intrigued on how the church began and what the church looked like. And I like to do a compare and contrast of today's church, modern church versus the first century church. And I will tell you, God had it exactly right in the first century. It was simple. You went in. It wasn't thousands and thousands and thousands of people. There wasn't pressure, downward pressure to pay the bills, to keep the lights on. They went into homes. There were 10 to 20 at the most people in a church home. And it was very simple. The pastor came in. He read the word of God. They fellowshiped. You know, I'm sure there were other things going on there that were a no-no because of human nature, right? I've read where, you know, there was a lot of adultery. That's why, you know, the New Testament addresses adultery so much in a closed quarter, men and women together. Very dangerous, right? Satan will come in and he will strip what God is trying to build down and destroy it. So we have to be careful. But getting back to the first church, it was so simple. Just hear the word of God. Read the word of God. Believe in Jesus Christ because he is the one that will get us through the kingdom, to the kingdom of heaven. That's who Jesus Christ is. Let's look at a supporting verse here. 1 Corinthians one thirty. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. Again, the wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So remember that. In Christ, we are righteous. In Christ, we are sanctified. In Christ, we are redeemed. We are able to find our place in the kingdom of heaven through Christ. Not through the governments of this world, not through the leaders in our communities, Not through our bosses at work, not through the companies that we keep or we work for. It is through Christ and Christ alone that we do this. And it is important. Colossians 2.4 Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with uh, persuasive words. And again, I hit on this a little bit, but it is so important. Verse 4 and 5 become the closing remarks of 124 through 25 now. We're seeing that there's a closing of what Paul is saying. Lest anyone should deceive you, because Paul is getting ready in the body of this letter to address the persuasive words. Now, we can look at this in some context. Maybe all the words that they were saying were not completely false because Paul uses persuasive there. They're able to persuade some to fall away, to look at Christology in a different light. So let's be clear and let's be very clear that persuasive words aren't all false. They're a way and there are techniques to get you to believe half-truths. Unless you get in your word, unless you stay in your word, unless you are hearing from God and discerning the truth and discerning the full truth and being able to spot the half truth. This is what Paul is really trying to get at here. And I will tell you, it is important for us as time goes on, as we get closer. To the end times, there will be many, the Bible teaches us, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. And they are all false teachers because we know when God calls us home, when Jesus comes and gets his church, the bride, we will know it. And there will be no reason for us to follow these false teachers. No reason. The Bible is very clear in many, many scripture, in Thessalonians, in Daniel, in Revelation, in Matthew, what we need to look out for, what we need to be in tune with, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the Word of God. 
Let's look at a supporting verse, Romans 16, 18. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Persuasive words. Do they serve Christ? If someone is trying to convince you to move away from Christ, on who Christ is, are they really serving the Lord Jesus Christ, or are they serving Satan? It's an easy question. It's a hard question to analyze at times, but you should be very understanding why the question needs to be asked, why Paul is telling us, because Satan will use persuasive words. Satan will use tactics that we are well aware of. He will use lies. He will use deceit. And I will tell you, we need to be both wise and honest when we are reading the Word. And we need to release ourselves from the sin in our lives by repenting, confessing, repenting our sins. And then Jesus, the Holy Spirit, can work in our lives. And he will clean us up. He will make us white as snow, <laughs> according to the Bible. Amen. Let's look at uh, two five. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And again, he's using very, very interesting words. He's admitting he's absent in the flesh, but he is with them in spirit. And this is when we pray for the Ukrainian people. We are with them in spirit. Our spirit is closely coupled. We are connected through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our spirits are connected. We are standing in the gap for the people of Ukraine right now. Because we are praying, we are opening up the Word of God. We are asking God with all sincerity, with all love, to protect His children. And then we stand back in faith and we watch every moment that God is controlling the circumstance, which is every circumstance, by the way, but we can see where God, we know with all certainty, that God is holding back. God is putting his hand on something, protecting something. Because God will be glorified in these things that we see and we hear. His name will be glorified. And it is our obligation to when we see and recognize God moving, that we glorify him. Even when we don't see, this is where faith comes in, when we don't see God moving, our faith is strong enough to glorify Him, knowing that He is working in the background and He is not exposing us to the things that He sees and He does. But through our faith, through our strong faith in Christ, that we will get to the kingdom of heaven, but we will also glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and His Father in the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at a supporting verse, 1 Thessalonians 2.17, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Again, this is when Paul and Timothy and Silas was being run out of town. I don't know if you know this. If you do, awesome. You know, Paul was only there, Timothy and Silas in Thessalonica for about three weeks, and then they got run out of town. So they didn't have a lot of time to give a lot of documentation on how to set up a church, how to run a church. They got in, they shared the gospel, they shared some of the things that was being poured into Paul by Christ through the Holy Spirit, and Paul was sharing those things. Timothy was sharing those things. Silas was sharing those things. And they got ran out of town. But it is through the Holy Spirit that the Thessalonica church grew. 
And if you read First and Second Thessalonians, you will find out that the church was growing on its own. It wasn't Paul that was growing a church. Paul was a vessel. It is not us that will grow the church. We are vessels. The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, God the Father, will grow the church. We need to be available. We need to be strong in faith in Christ. So when God calls us, we can answer the call. And we can move forward and we can take that step of faith. This is why it is so important to encourage and read the encouraging words of not just Paul, but all the apostles, of Jesus himself, of God the Father in the Old Testament, of the prophets of the Old Testament. All those words of encouragement are intended to build in us a faith that cannot be broken, a faith that may wane, it may bend, but it will never break because we have the strength of Christ in us. The Ukrainian people have the strength of Christ in them. We are seeing it. We are seeing it in real time. They are not posing right now. They're not posers. They are living in very difficult times, and we see them opening up their word. What difficult time are you going through that you ignore the word of God, that you don't want to open his word, that you don't want to hear from him? Do you think you could endure? Are you in a spiritually strengthened place of your faith that you can endure what these people are going through? I will tell you this. We are in the birthing pains of end times, and the Bible is very clear that we are going to experience birthing pains. And my prayer for each and every one of us is that the strength of Christ builds our faith. The strength and love of Christ is built in us, and we store up his strength, his faith. So when we go through trial and tribulation, we have the Word of God. We have the same examples that we are seeing. We don't have to go back to the first century now and hear Paul. We can see it on TV. You can see it on the Internet. You can see the pain that these people are going through, but the faith that they have by opening up the Word, and that's what we need to do. Let's look at a couple of encouraging verses. 2 Timothy 1.12 For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. What is Paul saying? What's that day? That day that he calls us home. That day that he calls Paul home. He's going to keep that strength. He's going to keep the things that God gave him, the faith, the steadfastness. Matter of fact, the steadfastness, the Greek for that is steroroma. It means a state of firm inner strength, firm position, being firm in firmness, being steadfast. Paul is steadfast in his faith. We should be steadfast in our faith. Because God will pour into us when we ask him and when we seek. Let's look at our conclusion. It says, as our relationship grows in Christ, we start to realize our life in the world becomes less important than our life with Christ. There is a significant difference between the two environments. One, the world is full of sin, selfishness, somewhat loving, resting in your own strength, etc. I could go on and on and on. Whereas in heaven, you have the opposite, full of love, kindness, selflessness, no sin, etc. We could go on and on, but there is a distinct difference, contrast between heaven and hell and the world, right? There is very little distinction between the world and hell. There is a causum, as the Bible teaches us, between heaven and hell that will not be crossed. Once you are in heaven, you cannot cross into hell. 
and vice versa. Once you are in hell, you will not cross into heaven. That's why it is critical now to make the decision. God has been talking to you, speaking to you, prodding your heart to decide what you are going to do with the light that he has given you. With Christ, this is how he will change our lives and morph us into the men and women he has intended us to be. It matters to Jesus as it matters to God, and it should matter to you to live a life worthy of the calling you have been given. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Keep the unity. As we pray, as we have common prayers, if we have a common goal to pray for Ukraine, God will hear those prayers. And we are in a united spirit. We are one with God. We are all His children. Let's start behaving like His children. Let's act like His children. That's the message. Most of us do, but we all fail. But when we fail, we have faith in Christ, knowing that when we fail, when we seek forgiveness, we repent. God will be right there. Jesus Christ will be right there picking us up. And that's where we put all of our trust, all of our faith in him because there's nobody else that can pick us up like Jesus Christ can. Nobody. Praying from a distance has a positive effect on circumstances, on people's lives. Try it sometime. Try praying for someone. You know, maybe a family member or something. In a couple of weeks, as you see, or if you see their life starting to change, we don't know what that time is. It's in God's time. But if you start to see their life change, you know it's God working. And then have a conversation with those people. I've been praying for you for XXX amount of time. And I'm seeing such a change in you now. What's going on? And they will profess. God is speaking to them. God is working in their lives. That is God's way to show you how much faith, how much prayer can impact someone else's life. Paul knew this. Paul understood his mission very well. He encouraged the churches. He was able to see the persuasive language and hear it. And he knew how to combat it because God equipped him. Jesus Christ equipped him to do it. And he will equip you and I to do the same if we so desire to have it. So let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for your time, for your prayer, for your awesome message of encouragement, Lord God in heaven. We do lift up the Ukrainian people to you, Father, and we know that your name will be glorified through this event and the events to follow, Father God in heaven, because no one can deny your power. No one can deny your greatness, Father. And if they do deny it, they are just lying to themselves, Lord God in heaven, because we know you are the creator of the universes, of the heavens, of all the earth, Father God in heaven. And you are the creator of man, and you are our king. And Lord, one day we will be with you face to face in our glory state, witnessing your greatness firsthand. And we just pray and thank you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't know how to pray, or if you want to learn how to pray, reach out to the church. If you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart right now, it's very simple. Just seek forgiveness from the Father. Forgive others that come against you. Don't harbor hatred in your heart or hard feelings, because it hardens your heart, and then you won't be able to hear the Lord. Repent of the sins. Ask God to give you the strength through Jesus Christ to strengthen you, to have you reject temptation. 
and fill you with joy. If you ask those things in your heart and you are able to sincerely say, Lord, I give up this life and I want the life that you have had for me since before I was born. I'm ready to live it. You do that sincerely, then you will find that you will be in a better place. You will be on that road to righteousness. And God will provide for you and he will protect you and he will keep you in his bosom for the rest of your days. Matter of fact, for eternity. The rest of your days follows infinity plus one, baby. It's called eternity. And it's awesome. It's going to be an awesome, awesome time. So if you need a Bible, please reach out to us. Reach out to the ministry for any questions. You got any questions? You want to discuss anything that you heard today? We're on YouTube. We're on Rumble. And you know what? Our website, ltsministries.org, www ltsministries.org. Go check it out. I revamped it. Um, let me know what you think. And if you need prayer, you need anything, just reach out. God bless you. Have a wonderfully blessed day. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all say amen. Lord Jesus.